So for our next speaker, like Andy Krepinovich, uh, he's a graduate of the Naval War College. Graduated in 2004, 20 years ago. So for your students that are sitting there wondering about the possibilities in your future, uh, please consider this. Since graduating, he commanded Strike Fighter Squadron 27, a provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan, the Fleet Replacement Squadron VFA 106, uh, the Carrier Wing 8, the Carrier Wing 17, who's commander of the Theodore Roosevelt uh, Strike Group, commanded Chief of Naval Air Training, and was commander of Second Fleet. And now he's in his current assignment as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfighting and Development. Please welcome Vice Admiral Dan Dwyer. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah, it was 20 years ago. Uh, I was sitting in those very seats this very same week, wondering how the hell am I going to get out of here so I can graduate on Friday and go on to back to the fleet. So I know exactly how all of the graduates out there sitting in the audience feel right now. But it is truly great to be back here at the Naval War College, where it just seems like yesterday uh, that I was a student here. Uh, and remember those times fondly. And, you know, as I think back at what the Naval War College did to prepare the next 20 years of my career, uh, it's just uh, incredible of what I continue to pull from, from those nine months that I spent here living at Fort Adams with all my classmates and seminar mates. And, and it really struck me the most important thing, not only, you know, how they how the War College enabled my uh, critical thinking, uh, operating at the high operational strategic level of thought, but the relationships that you build. And many of you have built those same relationships. And I'd like to start with a quick C story. And so, uh, as was mentioned, I left the War College and I, went, I was a, a new Navy commander, so they put me in the senior course. Uh, and uh, I left here after graduation and went off to my first uh, operational command in Itsugi, Japan. And then after that assignment, uh, the detailer called me up and said, hey, what do you think about going to Afghanistan and commanding a provincial reconstruction team? And I said, well, uh, okay, uh, sounds interesting. And after three months of training in Fort Bragg, I headed off to Afghanistan where I was gonna command a small unit of about 100 personnel from all services conducting reconstruction in Eastern Afghanistan. So for all the Army officers that are here, how do you feel about a Naval officer commanding troops on the ground in a, in a combat zone? What's your level of trust and confidence? Right, yeah, a lot of chuckles tell how you feel about a Navy guy running around on the ground in Afghanistan. So the four of us that were assigned to uh, RC East under the 173rd uh, Brigade and for the non-Army guys, that's an 06 commander, an Army colonel. We walk into the conference room, and we're all sitting there side by side in this giant conference room, and the attention on deck goes. We stand up, and the brigade commander comes in and walks up and gives me a great big hug and says, Dozer, so great to see you here. And my three partners are looking at me like, what the heck? You know the colonel? And he was a seminar mate here at the Naval War College, four years previous. And I had instant trust and confidence because of the relationship that he and I built here at the Naval War College. And for that next year in Afghanistan, he never gave a second thought. I briefed him on the plan, he said, sounds good, execute. And it was because of the relationships that we built here. And just my last tour at US Second Fleet where I was also dual-hatted uh, as a NATO commander working for SAC year. And, and all the Army folks know the current uh, U.S. Army Commander Europe, who's also NATO's LANCOM, is General Darrell Williams, who is also a seminar mate of mine here at the Naval War College. And so 20 years later, dividends are still being paid by my experience here at the Naval War College, and it's great to be back. And I'm glad to, bring, glad to say I brought the good weather with me from D.C. Not all good things come from D.C., but I hope the, the weather that I brought with me is, is you appreciate that. So with that being said, I'll, I'll move on. And again, uh, it's great to participate in the current strategy forum here today. You know, this important 
Symposium is a capstone event here at the Naval War College. Uh, and I really appreciate everyone from the foundation and the students and the faculty for being here. I'd also like to thank the president, uh, Reverend Pete Garvin, for your leadership and participation in this forum and for the great work that you do here at the Naval War College. It was 20 years ago I graduated from the Naval War College, but it was over 30 years ago that Rear Admiral Pete Garvin and I were young Lieutenant JGs flying jets in Meridian, Mississippi, going through pilot training. It's so great to see an old friend and shipmate here with us and in command of the Naval War College. I know you're doing great things, Pete, so thank you. Also thank to thank the Naval War College faculty and staff in attendance for your leadership, and thank you for the support you each provide this premier military academic institution. And thank you as well to the Naval War College students that are here today. You're the next generation of senior naval and military leaders, whether as serving in uniform or as civilians. You all think critically. We'll continue to assume increased responsibilities you serve and when called upon, will outthink any adversaries to defend this nation and our global interests. President Theodore Roosevelt was a great proponent of a strong Navy. He observed in his 1902 address to Congress by saying, a good Navy is not a provocation to war. It is the surest guarantee of peace. It guarantees peace because as TR noted in addressing an earlier generation of students here at the Naval War College, that he said, Diplomacy is utterly useless where there is no force behind it. Naval education is crucial to our ability to deter conflict and succeed in war. It is vital for our national security to further develop our sailors, Marines, Department of Navy civilians, sister service members, allies and partners at all levels to think strategically in order to deter conflict and maintain our competitive advantage. Education is the foundation for ensuring that we are prepared to meet the many dynamic challenges that will test our determination, understanding, and skills. The Naval War College is the U.S. Navy's home of thought that educates and develops competent and ethical leaders, supports combat readiness, strengthens global maritime partnerships, helps define the future of our service branches, and contributes original strategy and legal research to the national and international community. The Naval War College also provides that superb graduate level education that develops naval warfare competencies and prepares officers and civilians to lead, and as just mentioned, to think strategically skills that are integral to developing and ma maintaining our warfighting advantage. The current strategy forum is a tremendous culmination of your time here at the Naval War College. This, year forum, this year's forum continues their tradition since 1949 of exploring current strategy trends, challenges, and opportunities, and again, I'm honored to be a part of it. I'd like to talk to you about an important subject relevant to the theme of this year's current strategy forum, and that is where the Navy is going in this complex operating environment. I will talk about the Congress's recent update to the Navy's mission and share with you the priorities laid out by our CNO in her America's Warfighting Navy document that provide her commander's intent and reiterates the Navy's fundamental and timeless roles that define who the Navy is and what the Navy does. I will wrap up with where we see our Navy's design for the future. Let me start by saying that I could not be more prouder of our Navy and Marine Corps and the joint and allied team. Our leadership is very focused on delivering the Navy, Marine Corps, Army, Air Force, Space Force, and Coast Guard that our nation needs to get after our critically important mission. Specific to the Navy, the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act adjusted the Navy's mission to fully reflect what the, na the nation needs. For us to do in peacetime, we are to promote national security interest and prosperity of the United States. 
And in wartime, we are to carry out prompt and sustain combat incident to operations at sea. Our Navy remains the most powerful in the world. Along with the Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and like-minded allies and partners, we operate forward, around the world, around the clock, from seabed to space, in cyberspace, in the information environment, to promote prosperity and security, deter aggression, and provide option for our nation's decision makers. As we talk today, the rules-based international order is under threat in every ocean. The United States relies on the sea, and the role of the Navy is growing by the day. Just look at the last nine months. Our Navy and Marine Corps are forward, operating in situations that are dynamic and often kinetic. In the CENTCOM operations area, the US-led Operation Prosperity Guardian, a defensive coalition of more than 20 nations, continues to provide international maritime security in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. It is that strong coalition which has defended this strategic strait against over 100 attacks on, sh on shipping by the Houthi rebels. In response to the October 7, 2023 Hamas attack on Israel, the Gerald R. Ford Carrier Strike Group demonstrated the flexibility of maritime forces by quickly re arriving on station to send a clear message to allies and partners, as well as a clear message to those who may have sought to escalate the conflict beyond Gaza. The Bataan Readiness Group and the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit then continued that support in the Eastern Mediterranean, ably standing the watch until their departure. Dur during the Iranian attack on Israel, it was U.S. destroyers in the Eastern Mediterranean demonstrating our defensive capabilities by shooting down ballistic missiles intended to strike Israel. The Dwight D. Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group today continues to stand the watch in the CENTCOM AO of operations over 250 days of standing the watch to ensuring the free flow of commerce through the international commons. In Europe, in response to Russia's horrific and unjustifiable aggression against the sovereign nation of Ukraine, it has been the Navy that has deterred horizontal escalation in the maritime and NATO. The ongoing Baltic operations, known as Baltops, is currently underway. This premier maritime exercise in the Baltic Sea region with 19 NATO nations, one NATO partner, 50 ships, more than 45 aircraft and 6,000 personnel participating, and the U.S. Navy's participation demonstrates our commitment to the region and to NATO. In the Indo-Pacific, the United States Naval Forces, along with forces from Australia, Japan, the Philippines, South Korea, and other partners, continue to operate together to maintain the free and open global maritime commons and the international rules-based order that supports the commons that the world depends on. The upcoming Rim of the Pacific exercise is also the world's premier joint and combined maritime exercise during which a network of capable, adaptive partners train and operate together to strengthen our collective forces to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. This year's Rim Pack will run from June 26 to August 2nd and will see participation by over 25,000 personnel hailing from 29 countries on five continents. The U.S. leading this important exercise demonstrates our commitment to our allies and partners in the region, and those participating demonstrate their commitment to working with like-minded navies dedicated to upholding those international rules in the maritime domain. No other Navy operates at this scale or can build, train, deploy, sustain such lethal distributed force. I'd like not, I would now like to talk about some of those important points highlighted by our CNO, Admiral Lisa Franchetti, in America's Warfighting Navy. This document talks about who we are, what we do, 
and where we are going as a Navy. We are sailors and civilians who have answered our nation's call to service and lead with honor, courage, and commitment. We are here to preserve the peace, respond in crisis, and win decisively in war if called to do so. We must move more decisively to stay ahead. The potential battlefields of tomorrow will be incredibly complex and demand that we view everything we do through a warfighting lens. To support that mission of who the Navy is and what the Navy does, the CNO has laid out her three priorities for the Navy of warfighting, warfighters, and the foundation that supports them. The first is warfighting. That's about delivering decisive combat power. We will view everything we do through a warfighting lens to ensure our Navy remains the world's preeminent fighting force. We will advance naval integration with the Marine Corps and synchronize and align our warfighting efforts with the Joint Force. The Navy will drive interoperability with our allies and partners to deliver combined lethality. We must sharpen our warfighting edge in all domains, sea, undersea, space, cyberspace, the electromagnetic spectrum, and the information environment, all domains where the Navy operates. Warfighting is also about getting more players on the field. And that's, just not, and that's just not about generating more ships and sailors, though these remain critical. It's about getting what we buy on time and on cost, getting our platforms in and out of maintenance on time, and about stewardship and taking care of what we have so we can keep more players on the field. The Navy we have today will largely be the Navy we will have in the next 10 years. We have to make our platforms serve as long as possible and ensure they remain combat credible. It is also about using what we ha already have in new ways. So we need to think, act, and operate differently with the fleet we currently have today. More players is also about accelerating design, development, and delivery of the Navy's future hybrid fleet. We're focusing on expanding the reach depth and lethality of our conventionally manned fleet through disruptive and emerging technologies to include unmanned systems. These systems have an enormous potential to multiply combat power by complementing our existing fleet of ships, submarines, and aircraft through manned and unmanned teaming in areas like maritime surveillance, reconnaissance, mine countermeasures, and air wing support. More ready players on the field also means platforms with right capabilities, weapons, and sustainment, as well as people with the right skills, tools, training, and winning mindset. The second priority from the CNO is warfighters, which is about strengthening the Navy team. We'll use the principles of mission command to empower leaders at all levels to operate in uncertain, complex and rapidly changing environments ready to make and take initiative and bold action with confidence. We will provide world-class training and education to our sailors and civilians, honing their skills and giving them every opportunity to succeed. We need to ensure our sailors and their families are prepared for crisis or conflict. Our Navy is always on watch and we will be transparent with our families so they are prepared and ready to support the Navy's mission. A fleet without trained, qualified people is a hollow force. Our platforms and systems are complex, our adversaries are adaptive, and we need talented people who are willing to meet those challenges head on. Each sailor and civilian needs to understand their role and be able to connect their dot to the unit's mission and the Navy's mission. The third priority from our CNO is the foundation, which is building trust, aligning resources, and being ready. The Navy will earn and reinforce the trust and confidence of the American people every day. We will work with Congress to field and maintain the world's most powerful Navy and the infrastructure that sustains it. We will team with industry and academia to solve our most pressing challenges. 
The Navy plays an outs outsized role in achieving America's security objectives. The decisions we make and the actions we take today will determine the maritime balance of power for decades to come. The stakes are high and the time is short, so we must act with urgency. The Navy recognizes that speed matters and the pace at which we design, procure, maintain, and sustain our force must accelerate. Looking at the inner war period as an example, we need to unleash the creative power of the American sailor and industry. We must rise to the challenge of this increasingly complex and competitive environment. We also need to be flexible in our application of funding to keep pace with rapid te technological advances with our operational needs. We must also think, act, and operate differently, leveraging wargaming and experimentation to integrate conventional capability with hybrid, unmanned, and disruptive technologies. Tomorrow's battlefield will be incredibly challenging and complex. To win decisively in that environment, our sailors must be the best warfighters in the world with the best systems, weapons, and platforms to ensure that we can defeat our adversaries. With this as an imperative, we must develop and design for the future. The Navy is reinvigorating our long-range planning processes, identifying capabilities we must invest in now to maintain our advantages in the maritime advantage of the future. One of the ways the Navy is shaping its strategy is through Force Design 2045 vision. While that document is classified, what can be shared in this forum is that document defines the capabilities paired with the concepts information systems, and networks to meet the Navy's national defense commitments in that rapidly evolving strategic environment. The Navy is developing this vision through a process that is iterative, consistent, enduring, and trusted, and which provides a steady hand aligning strategic activities and prioritizing analytic efforts for warfighting advantage. Robust analysis is an important part of that vision. It underpins the service's efforts by providing analytic rigor and comprehensive examination of strategy and operational concepts and supports CNO decision making on the most consequential issues facing the Navy. However, without the creative and critical thinking men and women in our Navy who challenge all assumptions, strategy, and design are meaningless. A world-class education is the foundation for ensuring our sailors, Marines, and civilians are prepared to meet the many evolving dynamic challenges that will test our determination, understanding, and skills. To increase warfighting advantage and develop warfighters to prevail against all competitors and adversaries, the Navy must continue to encourage personnel to gain deep expertise, not only about key technologies, but also about our competitors and the future of warfare. The Naval War College team does that every day. You foster critical thinking and analytic skills and align curricula and research to areas that yield greatest warfighting advantage. You integrate wargaming into education programs and the curricula and share best practices across the Navy University system. All while conducting Naval relevant research and integrated wargaming to develop, refine, and assess strategic and operational level concepts. Bottom line, you support the fleet and the broader joint and allied force. Keeping our Navy the most powerful Navy in the world requires an all hands effort, all hands on deck. The Naval War College team plays an important role in that effort as we work together to think, act, and operate differently to solve our most pressing challenges. So my challenge to each of you is to take what you've learned here, back to your unit, your service, or your nation, and expand that network. Operationalize these strategic and operational concepts. Test and iterate them to find that competitive advantage needed to deter our competitors, and if needed, to fight and win. So in closing, I wanna thank each and every one of you for your choice of serving whether in uniform or in civilian capacity. 
Thank you once again to the Naval War College team for all you do, you do to support the defense of this nation, to include the education and mentorship of the outstanding men and women who are students and outstanding military professionals. And finally, thank you to the superb students who are here this morning. You are the leaders who will ensure we remain the preeminent fighting force in the world. Every bit of luck and success in your future your nation is counting on you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma Dwyer, for um, taking the time to come up here to Newport and join our audience and our students.